a little bit what you are specialized in or something like that? I give you the mic from now. Okay. Oh, for those who don't know me, I'm uh, Dr. Zakia. I'm uh, a psychologist. I've been a psychologist since the mid 80s. So I've been around a while. I was um, uh, head of psychology at the Douglas Institute for a number of years. Uh, and I also uh, do a lot of public education. I used to write a column in Metro newspaper every two weeks for about 10 years or so. I also chaired clinical ethics at the Douglas. Um, but I think one of my, one of my, I mean, look, I see myself more as a teacher than a psychologist, to be honest with you. I have a very didactic style and I, I, uh, I try to do as much public education as I can because I think it's important. Uh, I started, when I started, people were ashamed to say they went to a psychologist. Now just about everyone has one. Uh, we used to not be able to call them without their permission and, and be afraid of violating confidentiality. Now people leave messages. They, they <laughs> So it's nice to see that uh, we have things like Bell, Bell Let's Talk and, and so on. So um, um, anyway, I'm glad to be here and, and help as much as I can. All right, so um, it's pretty informal. I, I was speaking to Melina about uh, different topics. And in the end, we kind of threw a bunch of them together. <laughs> so I will, uh, I'll do my best to keep it coherent. But two of the issues we we're discussing was one, do we want to do a stress management burnout talk? And the other normally a follow up. So is, is more on mental health and well being. And in talking, she seemed to prefer that one, and I, I also agree. Uh, but nevertheless, we were thinking, what's best during exam time? Because you guys are, if you're like me, when I was a student at the, at, during exam time, I would be in this state where I'd look out the window or I'd walk down the street and I'd see people smiling and talking as if they're having a normal existence. And I couldn't under, un, imagine what a normal existence was. <laughs> I said, I'm in this funk. So I appreciate you taking the time to, to be here today. I know it's not easy, but I'll try and make it fun and interesting and, and we'll leave it at that, okay? So um, we decided to go on focus on, on happiness and well-being. And it's kind of a hokey topic, but the truth is that more than anything else, we're with ourselves all day long. We wanna be well. And what does it mean to be well? And what is happiness and, and so on? I don't have a, a specific formula. Well, I have my own formula and it's, it's based on my observations and ideas and a little bit of research, okay? Um, but I will take about five minutes to talk about stress management. That'll be more topic in January if you guys are interested in coming back. Um, and then most, most of the conference will be on, on basic well-being. Um, but before we begin, uh, and I'm gonna share my screen from time to time, okay? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the five-factor theory of personality um, because the five-factor theory of personality, this uh, is based on, based on a lot of research. There's all kinds of personality theories, but for the most part, uh, there's a consensus that we all find ourselves along one of five dimensions. And the five dimensions are as follows. Openness to new experience. That is flexibility of thinking versus rigidity. And we've always done it this way and so on. Conscientiousness is a, is a focus on details, detail-oriented kind of person who wants to make sure it's done right and who's concerned about studying, preparing, and all the other stuff versus, ah, eh, good enough. <clears throat> There's a social dimension, extroversion versus introversion. Uh, people like to be around other people and those who prefer to be alone. And none of these things are good or bad. It's about, it's just understanding that we're combinations of various dimensions to different degrees. And as we tend to be more extreme, we tend to have more difficulties in some circumstances. Um, I'm going to skip ahead to N. The mnemonic to remember is ocean. Neuroticism is a, an anxiety dimension. We all have you know, reactions to things. We have an alarm system in the face of threat and some people oh, versus others, eh, not so bad. So the degree with which we react with anxiety is also something that's pretty, uh, pretty fundamental. I skipped over agreeableness because that's the one that tends to be one that affects stress a lot. Agreeableness is the desire to please others. And it's a good thing to want to please others. 
um, versus me against the world, the antagonist. So if there's a dozen donuts at the office, someone brings a dozen donuts and there's one left, are you going to eat it? And some people, um, some people will insist that you eat. Oh, even if they haven't eaten one, but no, no, you have it. And others will take it and say, ha, I got the last one. In other words, how important is it to please others versus yourself? Um, and we'll talk about how some of these factors affect us in a second. But I want to give you that overview because who you are and how you are in your circumstances depend a lot on, on what your personality is made up of. And most of these things, by the way, you're born with. Don't look to blame your parents unless you were abused, but for the most part, we are who we are. Uh, and you see that very early on in children. If you have siblings, um, or if you have pets <laughs> from the same litter, you'll see that their characters are quite different from the very beginning. Um, so we're generally born with most of our temperament. So just as, a, as an aside, as I promised, I'm gonna talk about stress because stress is quite simple. It's a reaction to a challenge. If we don't feel stressed, we don't react. If there's a lion coming at us, we better run. If we don't feel stressed, we don't run. So worry is a good thing. If I worry about my exams, I'm gonna study for them. Um, so the question is what makes us stressed? Well, simple formula here is how much stuff I have, how big is my pile and how well can I handle it? or how poorly do I handle it? There's an interaction there. Um, if I ask someone to prepare a presentation for class or to write a letter or to do, well, let's, let's go with the presentation. Uh, a person who has self-confidence, they'll do the presentation, not a big deal. Another one who is so nervous and worried and oh my God, and has to practice in front of a mirror for hour upon hour, is gonna be very stressed by the same responsibility. So it's a combination of what you have to deal with, but how well you handle it. If on the other hand, I tell someone that you've got you know, three essays to write in two days, plus a presentation, it doesn't matter how good you are or how well you handle it, you're gonna be more stressed. In other words, if the pile of crap to deal with is big, you're gonna be stressed the better you handle it, the less stressed you are, the weaker you handle it, the more stressed you are. So there's always this combination of what I have to deal with and how do I manage it? So let's break this down into two parts. <laughs> let's look at the first part. Sometimes we create our own pressures. I wanna learn another language. I wanna get a degree. I wanna visit my parents more often or my grandmother more often, or I wanna to go to the gym three times a week. Um, those are good things, but sometimes they come from ourselves, right? And if we have a hard time to recognize our limits, then you have this is a gas pedal and this is a brake pedal. <laughs> so if you have just the gas without the brakes, then the pile tends to get big. But there's also pressure that comes from the outside. Teachers, colleagues, fellow students, parents, siblings, banks <laughs> sometimes. Um, I mean, who doesn't want the most they can get from us, right? Uh, if you do something well, oh, that's so nice of you. Could you do this too? Um, and there are people who have a tendency to want to please too much. That's why I mentioned the agreeableness dimension. Because when you're very agreeable, you want to please others. You have a harder time saying no. And when you do it well, people are going to tend to look to you for more because when they want a job done right, they're going to go to the person who usually does it well and so on. Sometimes we don't have a choice. If we're the only child dealing with, with um, a family issue, then you know, we have more responsibilities. Or if there's no one left to do our work, um, or of course, you know, deadlines and so on. So this is another gas pedal, and this is another brake pedal. So there's usually no shortage of demands that come from the outside. If you have no ability to say no, or you wanna to please too much, or you don't have much of a choice, the pile gets big. So the amount of stuff you have to deal with will depend a lot on where it comes from. But now it also depends on how you handle it. Um, sometimes people lack necessary skills. Like if I can't, if my job is dealing with social media, I suck at it. <laughs> so I wouldn't be able to handle it. 
if you don't have the technical skills, if you're required to do something that requires um, some math skills that you don't have, you're going to be more stressed, right? Uh, sometimes you're the only person, you lack support. Um, there is, let me just skip ahead here. Usually I have these backwards, but if we look at perfectionism, high standards, if you have a presentation to do, how much time do you spend on it? If you're writing a letter, are you digging out the, the, the thesaurus to look up synonyms all the time? Are you the kind who writes and rewrites every sentence? So when you have very high standards, it's gonna be harder for you to handle the same responsibilities as someone else. When you have high expectations, you also apply it to yourself. If you have that presentation I was talking about and you don't have confidence, you're gonna be more stressed by a presentation than someone with confidence. So I want you to take a moment to look at this slide, okay? And if you feel excessively stressed, ask yourself, That's where is it coming from? We yes. don't see your, um, your screen, that's why. You don't see my screen? Oh, Jesus, I forgot to share it. It's okay. <laughs> I've been pointing arrows and all this kind you of stuff. You can still follow and I wasn't quite sure, but yeah, we don't see. <laughs> all right, here it is. No worries. Uh, oh, oh gosh, no. Oops. I still don't see it. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Here it is. You see all this? Right. You see this? No? No. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Share screen. Why do I get? Perfect. Now you see it, hold on. Yes. Now you see it? Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> ah, sorry for the screw up. See, I there's certain necessary skills that I lack. Um, <laughs> therefore, I'm under more stress. I can actually see you now, so now it's working well. So just to go over what I said before, you have the, num the, the pile, the size of the pile and how you handle it. But the size of the pile is depending on a lot of pressures that come from the outside. Some comes from yourself, and when you don't recognize limits, the pile gets bigger. Some comes from the outside. And if you can't say no or don't have the ability or want to please too much, you're going to be under more stress or you're going to have a bigger set of responsibilities. On the other side, uh, we talked about these factors, uh, sometimes lack of skill or support, usually lack of confidence or very high standards will increase your stress. So I want you to look at the slide here. And if you feel that you're under excessive stress, ask yourself, where does it come from? From the people that I work with on about burnout and, and so on, uh, the factors that I tend to see more often than not are this one here. When you want to please too much, when you have that agreeableness dimension, um, you know, it tends to increase the amount of work you do because A, you want to you, you do more, but also you want to do it well. And when you do it well, people tend to ask more of you. Um, this one also is an extremely uh, major source of stress. Um, you know, a person will do an exam and study for an hour. Another one will study for hour upon hour upon hour. Same thing with writing a letter. Someone will write a letter and not care too much about, you know, uh, adjectives. Another one is going to spend hours going through thesauruses and so on. And lack of confidence is a big factor as well. We'll talk about this in a second. Uh, there are other factors, but for the most part, if you look at this, you will be able to identify your main source of stress. Um, so those are the three, this one here, this one here, and this one are the three major sources, most common that I see, but there are others as well, okay? Um, enough of that. Maybe we'll get back to this in a second, but um, I'm gonna talk about, well, I'll stop sharing my screen here, I think. Get back to you guys so you can see me. Um, okay. What's important at this point is that once you understand the source of stress, the next question is, well, how do I keep a balance? And how do I, how do I manage to be well and, and mentally sane given everything that's going on in our lives? So here's my, here's a, a little formula of happiness. 
Some people, some people like to define what are called the three pillars of happiness. The three pillars of happiness are work, family, play. Now, different people will come up with different definitions and, and, and so on. But for the most part, if you think about it, think about who we are, who you are. I'm a psychologist, your students, your paralegals, your administrative support, your variety of things. Um, and I get a satisfaction from what I do, a sense of contribution to society, a sense of responsibility. And that could certainly bring me some well-being. But when I, was a, when I was younger and I'd go to the park watching my kids play Little League in my shorts and my sandals, I wasn't a psychologist. <clears throat> I was a dad. I'm someone's neighbor, someone's son, someone's, someone's husband, um, someone's brother. In other words, my roles, I'm not just psychologist, I'm also that. I also have a connection to people. And that's an important part of who I am. And every once in a while, you'll catch me on my bike, riding my bike, or listening to music, or reading a book, doing what I want to do, and I'm not being a dad, and I'm not being a psychologist. I'm just being me. And it's important because what makes me happy, yeah, I'm happy doing my job. I'm also happy being a neighbor, being a dad. I'm also happy riding my bike, hitting golf balls, listening to music, and doing things that I want to do. And every morning you'll catch me doing my Sudoku and my crossword puzzle. And that's that. And nothing's going to stop me from that. <laughs> so where does my satisfaction come from? It comes from all of those things. And sometimes we lose sight of that. And we have to make sure we, we have to nurture each of those, invest in some. If I'm not connecting to people, maybe I need to make a phone call. Maybe I need to organize some social event. If I don't have enough interests, I might have to explore them. You know, you don't always start with an interest. You start with trying something. And once you do it after a while, it starts to become an interest. So just keep that in mind because I've, some people become so obsessed with work or school or whatever that where, where do you take the time from? You're going to take it from, well, you know, I'd love to read, but who has time for that? I'd love to go to the gym, but who has time for that? So usually you sacrifice your own needs when you're putting too much emphasis on your work and, and so on. And also when you're too busy, you tend to also say, I'm, you know, I don't have time to call anyone. I'll go see grandma because it's her birthday and I have to, but you don't, you're not bored. Who do I call and who do I hang out with? So just keep in mind that you need to be able to, to nurture all of your roles. You have more than one role. And sometimes people get lost in what they, in what they do. Um, okay, that's in terms of what you do. But another important balance in well-being is how you think. Because how you think has a lot to do with how well you, you function and how good you feel. Uh, so there are certain factors that I find most contribute to unhappiness or happiness, depending on, on the degrees of these factors. I'm going to mention a few of them. I'm going to focus on a couple because we don't have that much time. But the ones that seem to be the ones that create the biggest problems for us and for others around us, usually for others, <laughs> uh, one is rigidity. You know, the person who always does it the same way, you know, the toilet paper, you go up like this, or does the toilet paper come from underneath? And what if you're with a roommate who likes it the other way? And one of you has to give in, but if you're rigid, ugh. and the reason this is important is because when you're in an office and suddenly you're changing systems, suddenly you have to work online from home, or suddenly we're asking you to try a new software, the person who is open and flexible to new experiences has an easier time dealing with that than the person who says, well, this sucks. We always did it. It was good before. I don't know why we're changing things and so on. And you will particularly see this. You can take a really great employee, the top employee, and you change a system in the office and they become the problem employee. So none of these dimensions are good or bad. It depends on the circumstances but the rigid person tends to have a problem. Just imagine you have a mate, you're living with someone and you found someone miraculously who agrees on 95% of everything. Just imagine the volume of the TV, 
what you eat, when you eat, who does the dishes, how often you clean the shower stall, the temperature you set the thermostat. <laughs> Imagine you agree on 95% of things. What happens with the other 5%? You're never gonna find someone who agrees on that much, but even if you did, what would happen with the other 5%? Yeah. Well, if there's no ability to, if there's no flexibility and compromise, any relationship is gonna fall apart. Another thing that doesn't work is mistrust. Everyone will tell you a story of how they got screwed by someone else and so on and so forth. My teacher, my neighbor, my brother, my boss, whatever it is, Everyone has stories of how they get screwed. Trust me on this. It is about trust. <laughs> Mistrust is a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you don't trust, every relationship gets ruined. Um, if you don't trust why your boss makes a decision or your teacher or your partner, or whatever, then you're gonna question, you're gonna question, you're gonna question. At some point, they're gonna lie to you just to avoid an argument and you're gonna catch them in the line. You're gonna say, aha, I knew I shouldn't trust you. Look, you sometimes get screwed when you trust. So I don't think you should trust blindly. But if you don't trust anyone, you're never going to get along with anyone. So that's another factor that's important in, in well-being or, or not. The third one is the tendency to think in all or none. You know, the black and white, the, the all or none, the, the absolute thinkers, Inability to let go. There are lots of things in your life that aren't going to be just right. And like, for example, you can be relatively safe when you drive. You're never 100% safe. And COVID is interesting because a lot of people are, are thinking about risk and, and what should I do to protect myself. But the fact is, there's nothing you can do to protect yourself 100% other than not existing or not going out at all. When you drive, you do certain things to make yourself safer, but you also have to accept certain risk when you get in a car. So the more the safer you are, the more restricted you are, and you have to find this balance. So the problem is that people who think in all or none can't find that balance. They sort of kid themselves that this is safe and this is not safe, rather than this is safer and this is less safe. So the ability to think in gray, come to the gray side, will help you function much better. Another important dimension, you'll notice this in our society and every society is a tendency to think in groups. As human beings, we evolved in a world where we had to eat and not get eaten. And in order to eat, you know, if we can't find food, it's good that we're part of a group, a tribe that accepts us, which explains social anxiety, why we're worried about being accepted. But it also means that it creates an us versus them mentality. Whether it's men versus women, blacks and whites, Muslims and Jews, or whatever the world you live in, the more we think in groups, the more we tend to think that we're better than another group. And that also applies to things like teachers versus students, or staff versus, uh, well, one department versus another department, and so on. Um, and um, let me ask you this, true or false, all men are pigs. <laughs> you don't have to answer that question. <laughs> we'll get to that in a second, okay? I'll go, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get back to that question, but keep it, keep it in mind. Um, the two I wanna focus a little more on and uh, I'll do my best to, to accelerate things because uh, we don't have that much more time. Um, but two things that tend to cause a lot of stress, particularly for students, are really high standards and, um, and certain negative attributional styles. And I'll explain that in a second. But um, I, uh, I used to, I used to, I give people, give my clients sometimes homework to do. I'll ask them to write down when they have a panic attack or when they get angry uh, and to record the circumstances. It gives us an idea of the frequency. It gives us an idea of the circumstance, of the, of the pattern 
that creates it. It's very useful as a clinical tool. And I have people who do it properly. I have people who don't bother. And then I have a couple of interesting types of clients who come to my office. There are some who in the waiting room, oh, I forgot to write my notes and they take a napkin and scribble something really quickly and bring me this kind of job that they've done. And then there's others who bring me colored pie charts with graphs and percentages. <laughs> so which one do you think consults for stress? <laughs> that has a lot to do with when you're a student, right? There are those who do everything half-assed and there are those who are so obsessed with getting everything perfect that they're under much more stress than they need to be. So if you're not able to see a little bit of gray, if it's all or none, if it's 100% or zero, you're gonna be much more stressed. So that's one thing that really affects students a lot. Um, imagine that you have a doctor to, to, to choose. You, you need to choose a doctor for a cardiac bypass surgery, major operation. And the doctor is going to, you can choose between two doctors. Doctor number one, they call Dr. Chicken Skin. They call him Dr. Chicken Skin because he practices all day long on chicken skins. He cuts the skin because it's like a vein and he practices a suturing technique, the distance between each stitch, the distance between the stitch and the cut and the tension. The tension has to be just right, because if it's not tight enough, it could leak. If it's too tight, it could tear. He practices every day on chicken skins. You have that doctor or doctor, eh, good enough. Which one would you choose? So, of course, you'd all choose the first one, right? Now, let me ask you, who would you rather live with? <laughs> so that's important because, again, it's all about standards. It's not good or bad. It depends on the context. And so the higher your standards are, the more stressed you're going to be. But just because you have high standards, it's not an issue unless you're also an absolute thinker. If you're a black and white thinker, the fact that it's not perfect becomes stressful. Um, we might get to that in our next conference. I want to talk to you now, go back to the question of attributions. So the question of are all men pigs? Um, if you believe that, it doesn't really matter what you experience. If you believe that, you can have 50 men in a day treating you with complete respect. If one guy whistles at you or makes a comment, all of a sudden, ugh, guys are all pigs. And we see that in every bias. We see that when we're talking about immigrants or talking about an ethnic group or talking about an age group or a professional group or whatever. Doctors are all, lawyers are all, students are all, whatever. And anytime you hear that, it's a belief, right? And it's easy to see when someone has a prejudice, like look at all Trump supporters. They will distort anything, it doesn't matter. We tend to find proof of what we believe in and we dismiss stuff that doesn't accord with that. And that's important because it also applies to us and our self-confidence. If I think I'm a loser, then I will find lots of proof. So I'll give you a couple of examples of that. Let's suppose, that you have um, that you have two students, the two top students in your class. Everyone agrees, the teachers, the fellow students, they all agree these are the two tops, except that one has self-confidence and one doesn't. So now let's pretend the teacher asked them a question and neither of them knows the answer. Well, how does the person with self-confidence take that? The self-confident person will say, ah, that was a tough question. Or the teacher's being a prick, right? On the other hand, the student without self-confidence will think, oh, I'm such an idiot. Now, teacher asks a second question. And let's suppose they both know the answer. The confident student says, yes, I'm so smart. The non-confident student will do what? Oof, I was lucky, or that was an easy question, or thank God the teacher felt pity for me. Now, you'll notice in this example, two students, equal quality, equal competence, but different confidence. And what do they do? They will distort, they will make attributions based on their belief. 
right? And we tend to attribute things consistent with our belief. So the, the student with self-confidence attributes the, the, the lack of answer to the first question to an external cause. Well, that was a hard question. The next one, uh, I got it right because I'm smart. So it reinforces that belief. Anything that doesn't fit is because of outside factors. Anything that fits is because of me. Notice the other student does the opposite. Attributes the first failure to myself, I'm not smart. And I got the second one because I was lucky or because it was an easy question or those kinds of things. You'll notice that this is part of every one of you. We all do this stuff. We all have biases. We all have core beliefs and the core beliefs are reinforced by what we see. We make a mistake, oh, I'm such an idiot or well, that was hard. And, and it, what it does is it creates this imposter syndrome. You know how many people have the imposter syndrome? Pretty well all of you in front of me. <laughs> I know, listen, I worked at one point, like a couple of years ago, I had three different clients who, one had a PhD from MIT, was no, a PhD from Barcelona, was doing a postdoc at MIT. Another one had a PhD in, in biology and was working on, on global warming. And a third one had a PhD in physics working at Pasadena's um, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I'm in awe of these women. They're all seeing me for what reason? Because they all feel like they're losers. <laughs> what the hell is wrong with this world, right? It has nothing to do really with their abilities. It has to do with their beliefs and their abilities. And a lot of people will push themselves because they don't think they're good enough. And so it tends to feed this belief that we're imposters. And I know people who have, you know, members of the Order of Canada, for God's sake, who, who feel as if they're, they're imposters and they've been lucky so far. And many, many of us are like that. Why does that happen? Well, very simple. If you're in class and, and, and someone, a teacher asks a question, the other, and this person, let's say Joanne knows the answer and you don't, you think, wow, Joanne's smarter than me. And the teacher asks another question, and this time it's Melina who knows the answer. Well, Melina's smarter than me too, because I don't know those two things. Well, you can have a third question that's brought to you, and you happen to know the answer. Oh, thank God, at least I know one. But it's possible that Joanna and Melina don't know the answer to that question. So they're going to think, oh my God, she's smarter than I am, right? And so we're constantly being bombarded with what other people know that we don't know. So we make the assumption that they know everything we know, plus a bunch of other stuff we don't. Or you see someone with talent and you're like, God, they can play music. I wish I could play music. Or they speak three languages and they only speak one. Well, yeah, it is true that others will have strengths you don't have. But you also have strengths that they don't have and they envy you. Except you're not aware of that. So we're not in other people's heads. We're in our own heads. So that's what feeds the imposter syndrome. The truth is that we're all pretty well all the same. Don't kid yourselves. <laughs> and people who think they're special probably aren't. Um, listen, I, could, I can talk for an hour on each of these topics and I know I'm jumping ahead, but I do wanna, I wanna make reference. We only have a couple of minutes left. I wanna make reference to the subtitle in the talk, Finding Nirvana in a Cup of Coffee and Other Secrets of Happiness. So obviously happiness comes from, you know, having a proper balance, um, having attitudes that are not so extreme and so on, questioning your beliefs, um, questioning your attributions. Uh, but I wanna to refer to a poem by Charles Bukowski called Nirvana. And this poem by Charles Bukowski is a simple one where there's a guy on a bus traveling through the hills and they get off at, at a diner and he, orders a meal and the meal was particularly good and the coffee was good and the waitress was unlike other women he'd known. She was unaffected and she was laughing with the cooks and they were laughing a good, clean, hearty laugh. And he said, no one was aware of the magic that had just happened. People were back on the bus, reading, talking, sleeping, and they were unaware of the magic that had just happened. And you think about it, well, what's the magic here? It really wasn't much. He just found a brief moment where the company was pleasant and the food was good. 
And so your career, your degrees, your job, family, all the other things are important, but don't lose sight of the fact that in the moment you can also find some pleasure. I could be driving along in my car and listening to a song and bouncing around. And then I look on the side of the road and I see a a cross with some plastic flowers. And I think, ah, someone died at that spot. And I have a sinking feeling. And then the phone can ring and it could be an old friend. Hey, how's it going? And I can have those three very different emotions within 20 seconds or a minute. So it's important to, to not lose sight of the fact that, you know, if you're laughing now, laugh and enjoy it. If something tastes good, then enjoy it. So Happiness doesn't only come from finishing your degree and getting a job and all the other stuff. It also comes from living your life in a moment to moment world as well. Um, and of course, there are some things you have to learn to just accept. A lot of things that we don't like, we have to accept. Disease, sometimes we get screwed. Uh, sometimes we have to live injustices. Accepting something does not mean liking something. Remember that. Accepting something does mean stop trying to fix something that can't be fixed. So when we ask ourselves a question that has no answer, we tend to ruminate on it. So um, it's important to understand that sometimes it just sucks. Let it suck. <laughs> you can acknowledge that and then say, all right, don't torture yourself trying to fix it. Focus on your life. You'll notice that that comes and goes. You might be reminded of the sucky thing from time to time, but it won't dominate you because you're not searching, searching for justice. So sometimes you have to accept what you have to accept. Okay, um, it is 10 to, we're officially out of time. I do have two more slides. I don't know if you can indulge me for five more minutes. If you have to leave, you can leave, okay? Uh Thank you so much, Dr. Zakia. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. Okay. I've been oh. about happiness and people just keep writing about how you choose to be happy. Is that, do you agree with that? Um, you choose it? I think you have a lot more influence over happiness than we think. Uh, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a pithy aphorism, you know, take care of yourself, choose happiness and so on. I think it's important to understand what that means but certainly uh, it is about attitude. The, the challenge is to understand how your attitude affects you. And if you know how to well, tell sure. you properly, you're gonna be much happier. I gotta go teach a class. Right. No worries. Says, when are you coming back? <laughs> uh, well, sometime in January, probably. Okay, okay. don't do it in lunchtime because that squeezes things. Do well, it we tried, uh, we tried. Okay, general break, we will try to do that. Thank you so much for coming. Okay. okay. Thank you, Dr. Zakia. I have to go to work as well, but thank you so much. I appreciated this a lot. It okay. was great. Thank you. Thank All right, you my that. pleasure. Um, I have some advice on study habits. So <laughs> if you, um, can I just give you one piece of advice for the younger ones? There is no such thing as multitasking. <laughs> you can try to multitask. You can do two things at once. You're really doing two things not as well as one thing, uh, and you will torture yourself with that. Multitasking, the best you can do is a crossword puzzle while on the toilet. That's about as much as you want to do at the same time. Um, <laughs> sorry to be so graphic. Um, but also we have a tendency to cram, and learning is, is interesting because if I spend five minutes repeating a phone number, repeating a phone number, you might remember it, but probably tomorrow or the day after you're gonna forget it. If I just mention it once or twice and then in five minutes do it again, and then tomorrow remind you the number, you probably re retain that for a long time. So you're much better off studying for half an hour, putting it aside, doing something else, studying a little more. Repeating something is worth a lot more than cramming it in. So, and sometimes we just read because we're reading without stopping to digest and par what does that mean? Paraphrase the information, you will, you will retain it much better than if you're just sort of scanning it. So I'm saying this because some of you have exams coming up. It's just something to keep in mind. Um, 
the other thing, I guess I'll leave you with, uh, with another thought because most of you tend to focus too much on grades. And in the end, no one cares who the number one draft pick was anymore. It's how you're performing on the ice that matters. So once you have the degree and you get hired, what matters is not your final grades. What matters is, do you get along well with people? Are you flexible? Are you cooperative? Do you work hard? There is a correlation between intelligence and salary and success. Smarter people tend to go to school. They tend to get degrees. They tend to do better, make more money. But once you get to a certain level, about maybe 125 IQ, which is good, but it's not a genius, then it doesn't matter if you've got 125 or, or the IQ of Mozart or Einstein. If you have a 200 IQ, which is extremely exceptional in this world, but you're lazy or you don't get along with people, you're not going to have success. So once you're smart enough to complete a degree, that's all you need. After that, it's really more about the personal qualities. And I say this because a lot of students tend to lose themselves in in their grades rather than trying to just absorb as much as you can and learn what you can. When I was a student, everyone says, just focus on learning and the grades will take care of themselves. And I always thought, a bunch of idiots. <laughs> you know? But the truth is nothing was wiser as I became older to realize that it's true. The grades are not that important. If you're a smart student, you'll pass and you'll do well. It's what you do with the education that matters. And also how you connect to people and how you work with people that really is the key to your future success. So I wish you all luck and, uh, and we'll end on that. I know I've, I've passed it by five minutes, but technically we started five minutes late, so <laughs> not so bad. Okay, but I'm here for those of you who don't have to leave. If you guys have any questions, I'd be more than happy to stay as long as you'd like.